I just have uh, good vibes, with them. and that's very important to, to me whether you have vibes with people or not. And uh, I feel feel he, he can be a strong man and yet be a compassionate man. It's a tremendous challenge. Uh, yeah, I've been in the American League uh, with the Yankees for uh, 16 years, and I managed over there. Uh, uh, you know, it was time for a change and, and, and to go out on my own uh, uh, and, 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 and and get get the job done. And uh, this, this opportunity came up. Uh, I'm thankful for it, and I don't plan on disappointing. And with those words, a new era in Cincinnati Reds baseball was about to begin. Louis Victor Pinella, an 18-year Major League veteran and winning manager with the New York Yankees, was chosen as a man in charge of turning around a talented Reds team that finished a disappointing fifth in 1989. The start of the 1990 season was delayed a week because of the owner's lockout, and that necessitated Cincinnati to open on the road for just the third time in club history. The opener was played under glass against the Astros, and as it turned out, game one was a sign of things to come. The Reds fought back from a two-run deficit to tie the game and send it to extra innings. In the top of the 11th inning, Cincinnati loaded the bases, and Barry Larkin had his way with Charlie Kerfell. Barry waits. Here comes a pitch, and he lines a base hit into right center field. One run scores. Here comes a second run. The third run being waved around. Chris Sabo, and going to third with a stand-up triple is Barry Larkin. And Cincinnati has taken a 7-4 to 11th inning lead. That victory started what turned out to be a very impressive nine-game winning streak. The Reds could do no wrong during the streak. The best example of that came in game two. Paul O'Neill, a man with no sacrifice bunts and almost 1,100 career at-bats in the major leagues, was asked to lay one down, and he did it flawlessly. Offensively, everyone pitched in during the streak, as evidenced by eight games in which the Reds had 10 or more hits. But the top of the order, namely Chris Sabo, newcomer Billy Hatcher, and Larkin were the driving force. Boyd delivers, and Sabo swings, and a long drive left field. Going back range, looking up, it is gone! with a new shot at it, and he hits a two-run homer, and there go the fireworks, a double order. With a nod of the head as man drops the sign down, the pitch, and here's a suicide squeeze. It's a good one. In the score comes Morris, and safe at first is Hatcher. Base hit by Billy Hatcher, RBI as Morris streaks in from third. The Reds lead by a pair. On the mound, right-hander Jack Armstrong led the Reds through the streak and right up until the All-Star break. He was 5-0 and out of the gate and 11-3 and by the halfway point. At times, he was simply unhittable. He straightens up on the Riverfront Stadium mound and turns it loose. And a ground ball hit to short. Larkin goes to second, and this one belongs to the Reds. Jack Armstrong has just tossed a four-hit shutout. His first major league complete game, his first shutout. Is a seven game winner, equaling that of New York left hander Frank Viola as the winning as pitchers in Major League Baseball. The winning streak ended at nine, but the Reds continued to give notice that a divisional title could be won early. Lou Pinella's team finished April with a 13 and 3 mark, followed that with a 17 and 9 record in May, and by the All Star break had 50 wins and an eight game lead on the second place San Francisco Giants. Everything clicked during the first half of the season, and every move Pinella made seemed to be the right one. For instance, during the offseason, Lou named Mariano Duncan as a starting second baseman. The move was met with some controversy, but as it turned out, it was the perfect move. Duncan finished the season with a career-high 306 batting average. And it's hit to right field. Going back on the ball is Milt Thompson, still going back, and he can't get it. He has the ball bounce away from him. Duncan rounds second, heading toward third, and he is in standing with a three-base hit. And to the plate he comes. Duncan bunts a good one. It'll be fielded by Smiley. He throws. He didn't get him. Base hit. Excellent punt. And the good thing about that one was he didn't show it until the last second. One of the most important moves Lou Pinella and general manager Bob Quinn made during the offseason was to acquire first baseman Hal Morris from the Yankees. Sent to AAA in early June, Morris returned later in the month to take over first base on a permanent basis. He proved the Reds' front office to be profits when he started to hit. Surely ready to work to Morris, he delivers. And Hal swings and put two more on the board. Way back and hits the screen. 
and deep right field, and that one is tagged, no doubt about it, as it hits the foul screen about 30 feet up, and the Reds lead it 3-2. to two. During the final month of the 1989 season, Joe Oliver was handed the starting catcher's position. It was a test to see what he could do. What he did was to assure himself a starting job in 1990. Though the grind of a 162-game schedule would hamper his hitting toward the latter stages of the season, he began the year with a hot bat. Oliver with a high fly ball back into deep left center field. Does it have a chance? It's gone! Home run! And there is your star of the game. Joe Oliver cranks one over the wall in left center. Number four of the year for this impressive young Cincinnati catcher. And defensively, even the speedy St. Louis Cardinals proved no match for his strong right arm. Coleman gets a good lead over at first. Robinson with a hole. There he goes, and he's got that one stolen. The thrower, does he? No, he's out. Oliver does it again. He got a good jump on Robinson, and the ball just beat him to the bag and a good throw which is a rule rather than an exception from Joe Oliver to Barry Larkin runner going, pitch is taken, throw down to second, got him, they knock off another one Oliver gets rid of it as he normally does right now, throwing to Barry Larkin who got the tag on McGee and Willie limping just a bit as he heads on back toward the Cardinal dugout one of the more overlooked moves of the 1990 baseball season was Lou Pinella's decision to flip flop his left and center fielders after an early season knee injury, Eric Davis was moved to left, with Billy Hatcher sliding over to center. Production-wise, number 44 couldn't duplicate his career-high 1989 numbers, but he had more than his share of moments during the season. On June 16th, he teamed with Sabo and Larkin to do in Houston left-hander Jim Deshays. He throws to the plate, and Sabo swings! There it goes! It's gone! Chalk it up, home run, left field, number 13, Reds lead 3-2. And a fly ball, left field, that might go also, and it will. Back-to-back -back home run. And Davis sends it way back into left center field, and that's gone. Three straight home runs. Three consecutive home runs, Sabo, Larkin, and Davis. And that was the longest by far, number five for Eric. Then in mid-July, Eric came to the plate against the Expos with the bases loaded and the Reds trailing by three. Zane Smith has struck out four, has walked one, and here comes his payoff pitch to number 44. And a drive to left field. It is hit well. It is gone. Grand slam home run. Right field for the 1990 Reds was manned adequately by Paul O'Neill, whose steady all-around play was at times overlooked. O'Neill didn't post the numbers of a typical power-hitting outfielder, but he picked his spots for the big hits. It was May 18th. The Reds and Cardinals were scoreless after eight and two-thirds innings when Paul stepped to the plate against left-hander Ken Daly and ended it in a hurry. Into the wind on the 0-1 pitch. And a fly ball hit back into deep left field. It might go. It is gone. Home run. Opposite field home run to left by Paul O'Neill. A two-out home run. Number four of the year for O'Neill, and the Reds win it on the long ball in the bottom of the ninth inning, one to nothing. The phrase team effort is at times overused in sports, but it fit the 1990 Cincinnati Reds quite nicely. Lou Pinella believed in using his bench, and more often than not, they came through. Veteran Ron Oster was relegated to a role player and didn't exactly like his role, but he accepted it and more than got the job done. The 2-2 delivery, Oster grounds up the middle and in the right center field, a base hit. And feeling the ball on his way to second, Oster, he'll go in headlong with the double. Around Oster hustling all the way and coming up with the ball was Kingry and his throw way off target and Ron did not slow down as he rounded first base. 
But Oster wasn't the only one to do the job. Luis Quinones, Todd Benzinger, Herm Winningham, Glenn Bragg, Jeff Reed, veteran Ken Griffey, and Billy Doran helped to put together, unquestionably, one of the best benches in Major League Baseball. And Louis sends one back into deep left field. This ball game is tied up. Home run. I want to tell you, he hit that ball a country mile. A high, deep drive into the green in left field on a two-ball, one-strike pitch. His first home run of the year, and that could be a very, very big one. As the Reds tie it up with two outs in the ninth inning at 3-3. Todd just looking for a pitch up that he can drive. Patterson from the windup throwing, and it is swung on and grounded up the middle base hit. And this one belongs to the Reds. Todd Benzinger did not waste any time whatsoever. He hit the first pitch up the middle for a base hit to center field. And in 11 innings, the Reds have defeated the Pittsburgh Pirates. Final score, 5-4. to four. The check by Needon Pure pitching. Swung on, drilled into deep right center field. That ball hit way back there. It's going to the wall. In to score comes Braggs. Winningham will get his third three-base hit of the game. He has put on some kind of extra base hitting exhibition here today. And Cincinnati here in the 12th inning takes a 2-1 to one lead. And delivers. And a swung on. Long drive. And that might be it. It, it is a bye-bye, baby. Yes, sir. Glenn Bryce, his first National League home run. And the Reds lead it 2-1. to one. And a ground ball into right field. Another base hit for Reed. Here comes Morris. Here comes a throw by Batcher. Not in time. That's the throw down to second, and Reed is out. Safe. Three for three for Reed. Second run batted in. Swung on. Long drive. That's number one for Griff. Get out of here. It is, and it's a three-to-one ball game. They're in on the corners, and here's Doran. And Billy swings away and hits one hard to center field. Javier going back. Can't get it. It'll go to the wall. Doran to second base, and two runs are in. The Reds lead it four to two. Can't touch this. Coming into the season, the Reds knew they were going to have a very good pitching staff. They started the year with a strong starting rotation. Jack Armstrong, Tom Browning, Danny Jackson, and Jose Rio. You heard the kind of start Armstrong got off to. The others didn't have quite as dramatic beginnings. But by season's end, each contributed when he was needed. Browning with the 2-2. Swing and a miss. He got him. So now Browning shut out in jeopardy. And from the windup, he delivers. And a ground ball hit to second. Duncan makes a pick up and throws to first. And this one belongs to the Reds. Tom Browning. He tosses a three-hit shutout. The Reds run this current winning streak to five in a row as they have swept the Cardinals in a four-game series in St. Louis for the first time since August in 1966. One ball, two strikes, two out. Jackson getting it done here in the eighth inning, and a swing at a miss. Danny has his ninth strikeout, and the inning is over. Holding and delivers, and it's just swing and a miss. And for the second time, he strikes out. Kevin McReynolds this time swinging a four strikeout for Danny. Casey settles back in. Jeff Reed sends out the sign. Riho with the pitch. And he struck him out swinging. Number 11. And that is a season's high for a Reds pitcher. Riho winds, kicks, and fires. And a bouncing ball hit to first. Morris has it. He'll take it himself. And this one belongs to the Reds. Jose Rio throws his third complete game of the season. And in the process... Notches win number nine as the Reds win the rubber game of this three-game Chicago series with a final four-to-one victory. Rio with an affirmative nod of the head. To the belt, to the plate. Swing and a miss. He struck him out. And this one belongs to the Reds. Jose Rio has tossed a brilliant two-hit shutout. And in the process, the Reds reduce their magic number for winning the National League's Western Division Championship to 11. He knocks off the Giants. Final score, 4 to nothing. The frontline starters did the job during the 1990 campaign, but none was immune to injury. The Reds stayed together, however, thanks to the work of the Long and Middle Relief Corps. 12-year veteran Rick Mailer headed up the group that included Yankee product Tim Leana. 
along with Tim Burtzis early and Scott Scudder down the stretch. Baylor and out away from his second complete game of the season. And that should do it. Fly ball, center field. Hatcher going back, gets to it, and this one belongs to the Reds. Rick Mailer with a complete game four hitter. And the Reds have beaten the Cubs today by a final score of 8-1. to one. This has got to be especially pleasing for Leona because I'm sure a whole bunch of families and uh, members and friends are watching back in the greater Los Angeles area. Ground ball third, Sabo backhands and comes up throwing, and this one belongs to the Reds. The Dodgers go down in order. The Reds, largely due to an eight-run fourth inning, defeat Los Angeles 11-6, and they tack a game out of their lead over second place San Francisco in the Western Division. Tim Leana picking up his first major league save. Stretch and the pitch, and Carter swings and misses, and... Four strikeouts for Tim Burtzis here in the inning, and that ties the record. The last red, the duel, was Mario Soto. A 1-0. Morgan swings, and he grounds to Dorn. He fields. He throws to Morris, and a great job by Scott Scudder. You can't do it any better. When baseball fans look back at the 1990 Red season, the one aspect of the team they'll likely remember is a contingent of three relief pitchers who made up the now famous Nasty Boys. Randy Myers, Rob Dibble, and Norm Charlton truly did make up the best bullpen in baseball. And he's making Myers work on the mound. Here's a 3-2 again. And strike three call. He rings him up. Randall Kirk spotted that bad boy on the outside corner. There's a term for that pitch that baseball players use that I can't use. But it was a pitch that was almost unhittable. Blouser, right-handed batter, levels it back. Dibble winds, he kicks, and he throws. And strike three swinging. And this one belongs to the Reds. They pile out of the dugout. Rob Dibble strikes out the side in the ninth. The Reds have dropped their magic number down to two. Charlton checks in with Jeff Reed to the belt and to the plate. And a high pop-up. Barry Larkin calling. And this one belongs to the Reds. Norm Charlton has thrown a three-hit shutout for his first major league complete game, and it could not have come at a better time all year long. And Myers goes to pacing again. He always comes straight off the mound, goes to the third base side, and comes right back on top. And now they're standing here at Riverfront. Oliver sends out the sign to left-hander Randy Myers. He straightens up, and he turns it loose. A swing and a miss! And this one belongs to the Reds. The Nasty Boys were flat nasty with a capital N here in the ninth inning. Dibble fans Mac Reynolds. Myers blows away Strawberry and Marshall. And the Reds win it by a final score of 2-1. to one. As is the case in any big league season, teams go through slumps. Though the Reds never lost their grip on first place, there were times when things went wrong. At times, the pitching failed, and at other times, the hitting went south. But there was one constant, and that was a very good, and at times, spectacular defense. And Scott lets it fly, and it's lined into left field, a base hit. Here comes Harris to third. The throw going that way, and got him! Eric Davis shoots down Lenny Harris. Ronnie delivers to Gant, and he swings, and he hits one, two, lock, and he backhands, throws, got him! Low line drive at Larkin backhanded, actually with his back to first base, came up throwing on the long bounce, and Ron Gant fires his helmet away, and what do I have to do to get a base hit? And a ground ball hit to third, and Dawson comes down the line. Sabo throws to Oliver, he runs him back toward third, flips to Larkin, and Barry puts the tag. Here comes the runner to third, and he's out. All right. A double play. Here's a fly ball to center field coming on Hatcher. Billy got it. He picked it off, went head over heels, and hung on to the baseball. And this one a pop into shallow center. Going back on it is Duncan. He makes a catch, and the runner will not be able to go. Nice running catch by Mariano Duncan. 
in short right center field and a fine play by the red second baseman. Put a star by that one. 3-2 pitch. And it's grounded up. To, oh, and there's that play again by Rio. Flips on to Morris. That's the fourth time this year I think he's done that. Blindly reaching out backhanded behind himself to play it. At the end of four and a half, Reds three, Cubs nothing. Browning pitching and McGee swinging. Fly ball hit well back into right field. O'Neill going back. Warning track near the wall. Leaping. He got it. He took a home run away from him. Paul O'Neill went over the wall and stole one from Willie McGee. Well, you can put a star by that one. When Lou Pinella took over the Reds, there was no question that the talent was there. His job was to get the team to play up to its ability. He did it in many ways. Extra batting practice and computer printouts were both used, but he also fired his team up by example. That was never more evident than on August the 21st in a game against the Chicago Cubs. And Larkin grounds it to the left side. Ramos goes to Sandberg to throw on to first. They got him. The double play ends the inning. Larkin doesn't agree with the call, nor does Tony Perez, nor does Lou Pinella, who runs right out there to get in the face of Dutch Renner. He slams his hat down, and Renner has thrown him out. Lou is now going to the first base bag, picks it up, and throws it out towards short right field. And he's going to pick it up again and throw it further out in right field. I'll tell you what, this is the best act we've seen this year. He threw his hat down. He was run by Renner. He went to the first base bag. He picked it up. He threw it toward right field. He went back and got it and threw it out in right field again. And he has been thrown out. The inning is over. And boy, what a big time show Lou Pinella has just put on here at the stadium. The man is 47 years old. He shouldn't be doing those things. Um, I don't know. I Look, Dutch is a good umpire. He really is. I respect him. I guess it's Five games of frustration. The Reds led wire to wire, but it wasn't always easy. There were big games and big series during the course of the year. One of the bigger games occurred in front of a national television audience on a Sunday night late in June. After being hit by a pitch, Norm Charlton moved on to first base, then sparked his team and the almost 34,000 on hand when Joe Oliver doubled to left. The 0-1 delivery. Oliver swings and lines it down the left field line. That's a base hit, extra bases. Here comes Benziger. Charlton being held up at third base, but he's going to run through the stop sign and the throw to the plate. And I mean, a, a real collision, and Charlton is safe. I mean, he thrilled Mike Sosa. I mean, to tell you, uh, you talk about getting bumped at home plate. He got bumped, and Norm Schaub ran right through Sam Perrazzo and absolutely knocked Mr. Sosha on his can, to say the least. I mean to tell you, shades of the All-Star Game, 1970, Ray Fossey and Pete Rose. But boy, oh boy, I mean, he lowered his head and a wham and went right over the plate. So Norm Schaub, I mean to tell you, Drilled Mike Sosha, and you can hardly see the number on Sosha's back. I don't have any choice there. Mike Mike doesn't have the ball, and he's between me and the plate. If I slide, I lose. I mean, you've seen it a million times. Guys try to slide through Sosha. It doesn't work. In early August, the Reds played one of the more crucial series of the season, a four-game set against the Giants, who at the time were within four and a half games of the Western Division lead. The Reds met the challenge. They won game one seven to nothing, as Norm Charlton went the distance. San Francisco came back to win game two, four to two. But Cincinnati came back to take the third game, six to four. After that victory, Lou Pinella made a very bold prediction. Uh, I just said after the ball game that uh, everybody was talking about, well, you've won two ball games already. Uh, are you satisfied with the split? And I said, heck no, we're not satisfied with the split. We're gonna go out and beat them tonight and win three. That's exactly what I said. His prediction seemed doomed when the Giants jumped out in front to a first inning 4 nothing lead in the series wrap-up. But the Reds fought back and took the lead for good when Joe Oliver got the big hit in a five-run fourth inning rally. No balls to strike. Duncan at first, O'Neill at third, the pitch. Swung on, fly ball, left field. 
That'll get him in easily, going to the wall, and it's off the wall. Here comes O'Neal. They're going to wave Duncan in. He'll score. Oliver makes the turn and holds it second, and the Reds lead it 5-4. to four. Another important series of the year came in late September. The Reds were in the midst of a three-game losing streak. Their lead was down to three and a half games, and they had to face San Diego on the road. Again, they met the challenge head-on, taking four straight from the Padres and, in essence, seal their fate. The day Reds fans had waited for since 1979 finally arrived on September 29th. It was a rainy Saturday afternoon in Cincinnati. The Reds took an early lead against San Diego, but fell behind 3-1 to one by the middle of the sixth. At that point, the skies opened up and play was delayed. Meanwhile, 3,000 miles away, the Giants were dousing LA's last flicker of hope. When the final score reached Riverfront, the city erupted. Well, we are happy to report that as of 6.05 Cincinnati time, the Reds have won the National League Western Division Championship. The San Francisco Giants have defeated the Los Angeles Dodgers 4-3 to at Candlestick Park. It makes no difference what transpires from here on out at Riverfront. The Dodgers have fallen to the Giants, and the Reds, for the first time in 11 years, are reigning as National League Western Division champions. I, I told Marge when she hired me here that I really didn't come here to manage. I came here to win, and we've got talent here. The players did the job, and I'm, I'm, I'm just... Uh, I'm completely overjoyed. It makes it all worthwhile. You, you know, you anticipate this and you work so hard to get there. And, you know, you have so many great players that, uh, that that's played the game and haven't been able to, to uh, even get to the playoffs. So, you know, I, I feel fortunate for the, for my teammates. It's like they feel fortunate and, and it's bringing that uh, that tradition back to the city of Cincinnati. We've led since day one. I mean, no one no one's come close to the closest anybody's come is, what, three and a half games? I mean, how do you back into that? We, we played good the whole year and let it from... Letter every day, so uh, we we did, we took it by the, the bull by its horns, and uh, we rode it all the way to the final. Well, I, I think that makes it that much more satisfiting. I think uh, you know you win wire to wire, you got the contenders, and you know the guys that uh, really are out of the race and things are gunning for you. And everybody wants to beat the top team, uh, no matter what it is. It's football, basketball, it doesn't matter. Everybody wants to be the top team, and we're the top team all year in our division. And and uh, leading it from wire to wire, it, it has a special meaning. It feels good, you know, something that uh, I think people are calling us the, the pretenders instead of the contenders. And, uh, you know, now I think it's going to shut all the critics up. We we won this thing, and hopefully this will be the first of many to come. But the great thing is we broke a record staying number first all year. And, and I guess I'm speaking for my fans. We've waited for this since 79. But now we got it. The champion! Reds earned their first playoff trip in 11 years. Back in 1979, Cincinnati lost in three straight to Willie Stargell and the Pirates family. Again, in 1990, Pittsburgh stood between the Reds and their first World Series date since 1976 and the Big Red Machine era. Game one of the National League Championship Series. Thursday night, October 4th at Riverfront. The Reds got off to a good start. Here's a 3-1 to Morris, and it is swung on and hit into left field. Base hit. Here comes Larkin. Here comes Barry Bonds with a throw, and Barry is in, and the Reds lead it 1-0. Line drive, base hit to left by Hal Morris. Larkin rolling around third base and scoring the game's first run. And the pitch to Davis swung on and looped into right field. That's a base hit. It's going toward the line. Morris coming to third. The ball is bobbled by the right fielder, Bonilla. Morris is going to score. Davis goes to third, and it's 2 to nothing. Here's a pitch, and he lines a hit into right center field. That ball is up the gap. Davis is home. O'Neal goes to second. It is 3 to nothing. 
You ever hear getting a pitch you can hit? That was it. Huh? That was Those it. other two were lawing away. He knew what he was doing. Yeah. Pittsburgh scored one in the third, and the Bucks came all the way back an inning later. And the pitch, Bream swings. It's a three-to-three ball game. Just as we have mentioned, too much attention to Barry Bonds, and it cost Rio as Sid Bream takes him deep to right, and it's a 3-3 ball game. Things stay tied at three until the Pirates' seventh, and a rare Eric Davis fielding mistake. And the stretch. He delivers the 1-0, and it's swung on the fly ball to left, drifting back as Davis backpedaling. Still going, he misjudged it. The ball bounces over the wall, a ground rule double, and the Pirates take a 4-3 to three lead. Well, it looked like Eric had that ball easily, and he misjudged it. It's over his head. A ground rule double, and the Pirates lead it 4-3. to three. Shaky base running in the ninth inning snuffed out Cincinnati's last chance. No balls in the strike on Sabo. Here's the pitch. The runners go. The pitch is swung out and missed. The throw down to second, and they got him. The Reds try to put the double steal on, and it backfires as Lavalier goes for the sure out, or the one he thought he could get, and that one he got as he knocks Billy Bates off at second. So nothing the Reds are doing is turning out right. The Pirates won 4-3 and grabbed a 1-0 lead. Game two, Friday afternoon, October the 5th at Riverfront. Again, the Reds drew first blood. The kick and the pitch. And a looper into right field that's going to drop for a base hit. It's in there. On to score comes Larkin. On to third goes Winningham. Reds one, Pirates nothing. The Pirates struggle against Red starter Tom Browning through four innings. But in the fifth, Pittsburgh found the long ball from an unlikely source. And a high, deep drive to left field. And that ball is out of here, a home run. Jose Lean, who hit only one home run the entire season, rides a 2-2 pitch out of here, and the Pirates here in the fifth inning have tied this game up at one apiece. The Reds retook the lead in the home fifth, thanks to Paul O'Neill. The 1-1 pitch, and a fly ball hit back into left field. Barry Bonds going back, still going back, and it's off the wall. In the score comes Runningham. On to second goes O'Neill. An opposite field, run, scoring double. And the Reds have regained the lead at 2-1. to one. O'Neal capped off a super day with some spectacular defense in the sixth. He hits a high fly ball into right field. And O'Neal should be there to play it. And he is. And the runners, here comes Van Slyke to third. And he got it. They got it. Great throw by Paul O'Neal. What a play. Andy Van Slyke tried to... Gamble on the fly ball to right, hoping that O'Neill would not think he would come to third. Paul threw an absolute seed to Chris Sabo, and what a big defensive play. Those things don't happen very often. Those plays happen so quick, and, uh, um, it, it, you know, you can save runs in the outfield just like you can drive in runs, and uh, those type of plays right there are, are as exciting as any play in the game. Then the Nasty Boys close things out. Here's a payoff pitch and a big one for Dibble. And he struck him out swinging. Two-two play. Ground ball to second. Duncan throws to first. And this one belongs to the ref. Cincinnati has come off the mat after losing a tough ball game in this LCS opener last night. They post a one-run win over the Pirates this afternoon. The final score, 2-1, to one, and the 1990 LCS is dead even as the two clubs head to Pittsburgh. After an unusual two-day layoff prompted by TV scheduling, it was time for Game 3, Monday, October 8th at Pittsburgh's Three River Stadium. The Reds' offense quickly found itself against Pirates left-hander Zane Smith. Hatcher hits a high, long Get drive out. into left Get center out. field. It's Get hit out. well. Out. It's out of here. Billy Hatcher with a two-run home run into the seats in left center field off of a 2-0 Zane Smith pitch. And here in the second, the Reds jump out in front 2 to nothing. He only did it five times all year long, but boy, what a big one that one was. I'll tell you, Mariano Duncan may well be living on borrowed time. If he doesn't contribute in some way offensively today. We could very well see Ron Oster at second base tomorrow night against Bob Walk. 
Oh, Duncan 0 for 2 today and 0 for 8 in the series. First and third occupied, one out. And Duncan hits a high, deep drive. Way back in left center field. That ball is out of here. Three-run home run by Mariano Duncan on an 0 and 1 pitch from Zane Smith. The Reds have played long ball for the second time today, and they jump back out in front 5 to 2. I would say that that is contributing offensively in a rather large manner. Red starter Danny Jackson wiggled out of bases loaded jams in the fourth and the fifth and then turned it over to the nasty boy. And Dibble coming with a 3-2 pitch. And he struck him out swinging with high gas. Um baby. Um baby. Red's infield double play depth the outfield deep. And playing Martinez slightly to pull and he swings and he misses. And Charlton disposes of him on three pitches. Meyer straightens up on the mound, kicks and he throws, and a swing and a miss, and this one belongs to the Reds. Randy Meyer strikes out the side in the ninth inning. The Reds win the first of three here in Pittsburgh, and in so doing, they take a two games to one lead in the 1990 National League Championship Series. A final score, six to three. Game four, Tuesday, October 9th at Pittsburgh. The Pirates scored first for a change, but again, Paul O'Neill supplied pop for the Red. It's 3-1. O'Neill swings in a long drive to right field. Dondia looking up, and it's a tie ball game. Paul O'Neill, no doubt about that one, jumps on a 3-1 fastball, and he hits it ball way out of here, and Paul O'Neill makes the grand tour. Later in the fourth, Chris Sabo drove in his first postseason run. And the pitch, and Sabo lines it into right field, going back Bonilla. He has it, tagging Davis, and the Reds lead it 2-1. to one. The Pirates tied it at two in the home half of the fourth, but that airtight Reds outfield defense stopped the Bucks from a big inning. Rio with the 3-1, and Lean swings and grounds it up the middle in the center field. That's a base hit, hats for charges. The throw to the plate is it time. They got him. Well, Billy Hatcher, a strong throw to Jeff Reed and a knockoff Sid Bream for the final out of the inning. It was still tied in the top of the seventh for Chris Sabo. Levier hangs the sign and the stretch. The pitch. Sabo swings. Long drive and it's a four to two ball game. No doubt about that one. Chris Sabo, his first home run of the series, and the Reds lead it four to two. Jay Bell homered for the Pirates, leading off the eighth, cutting the Cincinnati lead to four three, and setting the stage for Eric Davis and what Reds fans will always refer to as the throw. One out, a run is in. Jay Bell led off the inning with a home run off Rio. Van Slyke is fly to left. And here's a line shot to deep center field. Going back is Hatcher at the wall, leaping. He cannot get it. Bonilla comes to second. He's going to try for three. Here comes a throw, and they got him. They knock him off. Eric Davis with a perfect throw. He came over from left field, took the ball off the wall, and fired a one-bound strike to Chris Sabo, and Bonilla is gone believe that Bobby would try for three there and particularly watching Eric what a great play by Davis backing that ball up uh, back of the play up and Billy a great effort trying to catch it but I scared me I thought it was out of the ballpark and it only missed by about a foot and a half but give Eric Davis a whole bunch of credit by getting there right now and backing the play up and throwing an absolute strike to Chris Sable. Boy, you can't do it any better than that. I was doing what I was supposed to do. I was over there helping out, feel the back him up. I, I knew if, if uh, Patrick would get back there and he had time to catch it, and he didn't, and he stayed in the ballpark, and I had to be there to back him up because he's an aggressive outfielder, and uh, uh, he went after the ball with everything he had, and, uh, you know, the ball came. Everything just happened so fast. He came to me, I picked it up and threw it. Reds pinch hitter Luis Quinone has knocked in an insurance run on the top of the ninth inning, making it 5-3 to three Cincinnati, and setting the stage for another overpowering Rob Dibble performance. Dibble in front, two strikes and nothing on Jeff King. He steps out, he steps back in. Robbie rocks to the wind. And his pitch is taken. Strike three call, and this one belongs to the Reds. Cincinnati is one win away from winning the 1990 National League pennant 
and going on to the World Series. A battle back tonight and post a second straight victory here at Three Rivers and make it three wins in a row over the Pirates after the opening game loss in Cincinnati. Cincinnati 5, Pittsburgh 3. The Reds were one win from the World Series, up three games to one. Game 5, Wednesday, October 10th at Three Rivers. The Pirates pitched their ace, Doug Drabeck, trying to prolong the LCS and force a sixth game in Cincinnati. The Reds scored one on the top of the first, but the Bucks tagged Tom Browning for two in the home half. And the Pirates added another in the fourth on Don Slott's sacrifice fly. Slott swings and a fly ball to center field. Herm Winningham eyes it up, tagging Bonds, and here comes Bonds, here comes the throw, and it's not near in time, and the Pirates lead it three to one. Drabeck basically toyed with Reds hitters until the eighth. Well, the war begins to build here at Three Rivers. A 3-2 count on Larkin. A hit means a run. Winningham is on deck. Drabeck straightens up on the mound. And he's in with a payoff pitch. And Larkin swings and hits it hard to left. Going back, Bonds. It's over his head. It hits off the base of the wall. Quinones scores. Larkin goes to second with a stand-up double. And the Reds have closed to within a run at 3-2. to two. Pirate manager Jim Leland stuck with Dre Beck in the ninth. The Reds loaded the bases and it boiled down to Pirate reliever Bob Patterson against the Reds' Jeff Reed. And a 1-1 count. Patterson with Reed. The left-hander kicks and throws. Jeff swings. Ground ball. Glove by Bonilla. He throws to second for one. The throw to first. A double play and the Pirates win it. Jeff Reed grounds into a 5-4-3 double play. A ball that was hit wide of third. Bonilla made a nice play for just an instant. It looked like that ball might snake through into left field. But Bonilla came up with a ball. Delta lean for the force. And the throw to first doubles up Reed and ends the game. Final Pirates 3, Reds 2. And the LCS headed back to Riverfront with Cincinnati still a leg up. Three games to two. Game six, Friday, October 12th. Ted Power was a surprise starter for Pittsburgh, and he gave up a tainted run in the first inning. Larkin going, the pitch is swung out and missed, the throw to second is in the center field, and Larkin will come to third, a steal and a throwing error. He delivers again, and Davis grounds to short. Jay Bell to Jose Lean, and that's all they get, the force out at second as Larkin scores and the Reds lead 1-0. Reds lefty Danny Jackson mowed down the first 13 Pirate batters before Pittsburgh tied it in the fifth on a Carmelo Martinez double. The bullpen's Matt Z. Rose until the home seventh when Ron Oster triggered the decisive rally. Payoff on the way, and it's swung on and lined in the right field. That's a base hit. And R.J. Reynolds fields the ball and returns to the infield. So Oster drops a single along the right field line, leading it off here in the seventh. The 1-0. Hatcher swings, lines it center field. That's a base hit. Over to cut it off. Van Slyke on his way to third is Oster. Ah, just sit back and relax, folks. It's another ball game at the old ball orchard. What the heck? Full count to Luis Quinones. They're on their feet here at Riverfront. Hatcher goes, pitch, well on line drive, base hit to right field. Here comes Oster. Hatcher will be held at third, and the Reds take a two to one lead. Well, Luis Quinones, the leading pinch hitter for the Reds, gets the job done as he lines it to right field. R.J. Reynolds cuts it off. And the Reds take a two to one lead. Again, Lou Pinella turned things over to the capable nasty boys. But on this memorable night, Randy Myers would need help from right fielder Glenn Braggs and the catch. Dibble is ready in the bullpen if his services are needed. It's a 3-2 count, and Bonds has to be running. Despite trailing by a run, he's not, and the pitch is swung on. Fly ball hit back into deep right center field. On the warning track, Braggs reaches up. He makes a catch. He picked it off the top of the wall. A long drive to right field. Braggs went back, reached up at the top of the fence, and made the catch. We, of course, had the benefit of the replay. And Glenn Braggs got back with plenty to spare to position himself. Martinez left the plate with hopes that that ball was hit well enough to get out of here. Braggs drifted back, went to the base of the wall. He reached up, and he made the catch. 
Whether or not it would have been able to go is hard to say. So now the Pirates are down to their final out. I don't know how far the ball was out of park, you know, so, um, you know, I just I just wanted to give myself a chance to catch it if I if I had a chance. And um, when he hit it, you know, my, my heart stopped for a sec, you know, but I, I just wanted to get back to the wall. And I think that was the key. Myers closed out the game and the LCS with a flourish. They cheer and they groan here at the ballpark. 56,079. Myers and out away. A strike away. Working to Don Slott with a 2-2 pitch. Here it comes. And he struck him out swinging. And the 1990 National League Championship belongs to the Cincinnati Reds. The mob scene around the mound. It now goes out behind second base. The crowd is on its feet and roaring here at Riverfront Stadium as the Reds have taken their first National League championship since 1976. They have defeated the Pittsburgh Pirates in the sixth game by a final score of two to one. An unbridled joy amidst the fireworks overhead has broken out at Riverfront Stadium. And the nicest thing about it all is it happened right here in Cincinnati. It's been a long season, man. We've worked as hard as anybody and uh, it feels so good to come out of here with National League pin. Randy Myers and Rob Dibble were named co-MVPs, combining for 10 and two-thirds shutout innings and 17 strikeouts. It was out of the World Series and a head-on collision with the American League champion Oakland A's, who'd swept the Giants in the 1989 World Series and obliterated the Boston Red Sox, taking four straight in the 1990 ALCS. The Athletics proclaimed themselves a dynasty, and the media was quick to agree. Comparisons to the all-time great teams flowed easily. The Bash brothers, Jose Canseco and Mark McGuire, 20 game owners Dave Stewart and Bob Welsh, and bullpen closer Dennis Eckersley created an imposing image. The Reds were labeled a three to one underdog, and many media pundits doubted the Reds could even win a game. World Series game number one, Tuesday, October 16th, Riverfront Stadium. The Reds' first fall classic engagement in 14 years, dating back to 1976, and a surgical four-game sweep that year of the New York Yankees. Cincinnati's Jose Rijo put Oakland in his place early. And strike three call on the outside corner gets Henderson looking. The wind, the pitch, and it's strike three call. Jose Rijo knocks him off in order. A strikeout of Henderson, a ground out of McGee, and a strikeout of Canseco. And the Reds stuck to their LCS script. They scored early, and Eric Davis made a very powerful statement. Hatcher running. The pitch is swung on. A high, deep drive to center field. It may go. It will. Home run. Eric Davis explodes the first pitch thrown by Dave Stewart onto the concourse in center field. Hatcher scores in front of him, and Cincinnati has taken a first inning two to nothing lead. Well, any, anytime you can score runs off of Dave Stewart, you have to feel confident because he's a dominating pitcher. And, uh, you know, our, our team has rallied around not just myself, but anybody that, that, that's got a big hit for us all year. It's been, it's been a total team effort. Anytime one guy comes up and get a big hit, the whole team seems to rally around that. Cincinnati tag menacing A starter Dave Stewart for two more in the third. Stewart sets and delivers, and Hatcher swing, pulls it fair down the left field line, down in the corner. Henderson playing the corner, and he knocks it off. Here comes Larkin. He's coming to the plate to throw his left target, and it gets through and it's off the glove of Stewart. He picks it up. In the third goes Hatcher, and it's a 3 to nothing ball game. The 1-1. One, one. O'Neill bounces it off to the left of the right of the mound. Stewart fields. Hatcher scores. It's four to nothing. Chris Sabo put the game out of reach early in the fifth. Nelson pitching consistently from behind and this is first inning of relief. And certainly not the overpowering kind of pitcher that can get away with it. Line drive, base hit into center field. Here comes O'Neal. Here comes Davis. The Reds lead it seven to nothing. Chris 
Sabo provides for his club a tremendous pick-me-up. With a low line drive, base hit up the middle, O'Neill and Davis score, and the Reds right now seemingly are in Fat City. The A's manage just seven hits off Reho, Dibble, and Myers, only two for extra bases. The Oakland pitching staff seems surprisingly hittable. It was a great start. World Series Game 2, Wednesday, October 17th in Cincinnati, and without question, the most thrilling game of the postseason. The A's chase red starter Danny Jackson with four runs early. Cincinnati made it a one-run game in the fourth, though, thanks to pinch hitter Ron Oster. The pitch, Oster swings and hits it into center field. That's a base hit. They're going to wave Oliver to the plate. Henderson's throw in is not in time. It gets through Hassey. In the second goes Oster, and it's a 4-3 to three ball game. The Reds' long relievers, Scott Scudder and Jack Armstrong, shine with four and a third innings of shutout ball to keep it close. In fact, Armstrong repeated his impressive all-star game performance. A full count to Jose Canseco. Armstrong into the line to pay off. Swing and a miss. He got him with a fastball away. And for Armstrong, his second strikeout. That's seven in a row now for Jack. Armstrong's payoff on the way. McGuire swings and misses. And back-to-back -back strikeouts. And Mark not happy with... That swing it off. Still down 4-3. The Reds manufactured a tie in the eighth. Three for three tonight. Six for six in the World Series. A swing and a fly ball to right. Canseco going after it. He will not be able to get it. The ball hits off the end of his glove. Hatcher round second. He will end up at third base. Bragg's trying to do it also. And a bouncing ball up the middle. It's fielded by Gallego. He tags a runner, throws to first, not in time. And the run scores, and the game is tied. With a game tied, 4-4 extra innings was a real possibility. And the Reds running out of pitchers, we made a little World Series history. Joe, we've got a rather unusual message. We understand that Tom Browning's wife, Debbie, has gone into labor. He has left the ballpark, and a call apparently has just come up from the Reds' clubhouse to make an appeal over our airwaves for Tom Browning to come back to the ballpark in the event that they have to use him to pitch tonight. Well, Tom, if you're listening, uh, I'd happened to him once before. It certainly you know, did. So, Tom, if you're listening to the broadcast, uh, we've just gotten a word that from the Reds clubhouse that, uh, if at all possible, please get back to the ballpark in the event that they might need you. As it turned out, Tom wasn't needed. Wife Debbie gave birth to Tucker Thomas later that night. Still tied 4-4 in the bottom of the 10th inning, Oakland brought in its hammer, Dennis Eckersley, and rookie Billy Bates promptly began an improbable rally. Well, Bates back into the batter's box, and Eckersley the 0-2 once again. Swung on, high chopper, and fielding Lansford. He can't handle it, and that'll be a base hit for Billy Bates. And delivers, and Sabo swings a ground ball, base hit in the left field. Sabo's third, and 13th for the Reds, and... They're in business here in the 10th inning. Eckersley checks Bates. He delivers. Oh, Oliver swings and grounds it. Fair down the left field line. Billy Bates is scoring. This one belongs to the Reds. Well, how about that? Joe Oliver bounces one over the bag down the third baseline. Billy Bates scores, and the Reds lead this World Series two games to none. Something I've always dreamed about as a kid. Uh, I think everybody has done that uh, growing up, uh, imagining themselves in the World Series and and then finally getting the big hit in the ninth or tenth inning. Uh, this is something that a dream has finally come true. Special recognition for Billy Hatcher. His seven straight hits over two games was a new World Series record. World Series game number three, Friday, October 19th in Oakland. The experts expected the A's to bounce back on their home natural turf, using the American League designated hitter, and teeing off against long ball prone red starter Tom Browning. But that's not what happened. Trying to become a leadoff base runner here in inning number two. And the pitch is swung on and hit well back into left center field. It's hit way back. It's gone. Chris Sabo jumps on a three and two pitch and drives it over the left field wall here in the second to give Cincinnati a one nothing lead. Harold Baines gave Oakland the lead briefly in the bottom of the second with a two run homer. 
In the third, the Reds put together the inning. Or the stretch and the pitch. And it's swung on and line to center field. And Henderson won't get to that one. On his way home is Hatcher. On the way to third is O'Neill. The throw off target in the second goes Davis. The throw not in time. And it's a tie ball game. The 0-1 to Morris. And Hal swings and grounds to McGuire. That'll score O'Neill. And on to third goes Davis. And the Reds lead it 3-2. to two. Mike Moore ready with a 2-0. And Sabo swings and hits a deep to the left field. And that one is bye-bye. And the Reds lead it 4-2. to two. The payoff to Oliver. And Joe swings and lines it off the glove of Carney Lansford down the left field line. That's extra bases. Scoring is Benzinger. Throw to second. Not in time. And the Reds lead it 6-2. to two. Duncan lines it up the middle. That's a base hit. Oliver will be waved in. He'll score. And it's a 7-2 to two ball game. And Larkin swings on the curveball. Hits it well into left center field. That's extra bases. Duncan will score easily. On his way to second, Larkin makes the turn. He's headed for third. Here's Gallego's throw. Not in time. And the Reds lead it 8-2. to two. Chris Sabo had a career night. Two home runs and three RBIs. And he set a series record handling 10 chances flawlessly at third base. Reds 8, A's 3. Cincinnati was up three games to none. And within one win of an improbable World Series victory and an incredible sweep. World Series Game 4, Saturday, October 20th in Oakland. Jose Rijo pitched against Dave Stewart, and the game started on a sour note for the Reds. Stewart rocks to the windup, bringing it on up there, and Hatcher hit. And apparently got it on the elbow, and Billy in all sorts of pain. He is down, and I mean hurting and hurting rather badly. Hatcher, with a 750 batting average, was forced out with a bruised hand and replaced by Herm Winningham. Bottom of the first, Eric Davis joined Hatcher on the sideline. Line drive in the left center field, and Davis made the catch. No, he didn't. The ball got away from him, and Eric is injured as McGee goes to second base. Carney Lansford singled in McGee. It was 1-0 Oakland. Stewart and Riho matched scoreless innings until the Reds broke through in the eighth. Cracks down a strike. Here comes a pitch, and it's swung on and grounded toward shortstop, fielded by Gallego. He throws to second, and that's all they get. They got the force out at second base on Paul O'Neill as Larkin comes across with a tying run. Winningham goes to third, and Braggs picks up the run batted in. Morris waiting on the pitch, and Stewart unloading to the plate. And a swing and a high fly ball hit back into right field. That's going to get the job done. Willie McGee makes a catch. Winningham tags and comes home. And the Reds in the eighth inning have taken a 2-1 to one lead. Jose Rijo struck out Oakland's Dave Henderson to open the A's last gas ninth. It was a 20th hitter in a row retired by Rijo. But Lou Pinella wasted no time summoning closer Randy Myers from the bullpen. Myers underhanding the ball that Ted Hendry gave to him and gets a new one back and typically goes to the third base side of the mound and walks straight up to the pitching rubber. Lansford, good hitting Oakland third baseman, steps in, levels a bat, and Myers bringing it. And the pitch is hit in the air, foul, off first, Benzinger backing and calling. And the 1990 World Championship belongs to the Cincinnati Reds. As you might expect, they pile out of the dugout. They are jumping up and high-fiving, all smiles as Lou Pinella and his coaching staff break out of the dugout Gloves and caps all over the infield. The Cincinnati Reds have done the absolute improbable by defeating the club considered to be the best in Major League Baseball, and they've done it in a four-game series sweep. Fourteen years have gone by where the Reds have been sitting and watching, and now in 1990 they have claimed a world championship and they have without question stamped themselves in this first year of a new decade as unquestionably the best team in Major League Baseball. Yeah, I tell you, nobody can say that uh, they gave it to us. Nothing was given to us all year, wire to wire, and then we weren't given much of a chance with Pittsburgh. Uh, they, they were picked for favorites, and we weren't given a chance at all with uh, Oakland. And, uh, you know, nobody can say that we, uh, <laughs> nobody can say we walked into this thing. We went out and beat them, and we won it, and uh, we won it fair and square, and uh, we're number one. We're the world champions. The odds makers and experts were confounded. The impossible sweep was completed. The incredible dream became reality. The 1990 Cincinnati Reds world champions. Jose Rijo was selected series MVP. 
with two victories in 15 and one third innings of nine hit one run baseball. The Reds bullpen combined for 13 shutout innings. The offense outscored Oakland 22 to eight and batted a composite 317. Billy Hatcher hit a series record 750 and Chris Sabo a cool 563. It was an old fashioned, no excuses, bright as day, tail kicking. Wire the wire from April to October. The Reds were number one. Their sweep of Oakland added a final emphatic exclamation point to a very special season. And that you just can't touch, no matter what. The 1990 Reds baseball season exemplifies what America is all about and what made this country great, that hard work and, and dedication and the will to win and pride in your work. And I think that was very evident on this ball club this year. And I'd like to just tip my hats to them all. They played their hearts out and they're world champions.